It's hard to believe, but it was just two years ago that Boston was in the middle of one of the most epic showdowns in the city's history over whether or not we should host the 2024 Olympic Games. In January 2015, the U.S. Olympic Committee announced Boston would be the U.S. entry. And with that, seven months of selling, debate, protest, and rowdy meetings around the city ensued. A new group formed, No Boston Olympics, and their name described their mission. Then suddenly, on July 27th, a hasty news conference was called, and it all came to an end. Boston is no longer pursuing the 2024 Olympic and Paralympic Games. Actually, our guests think it wasn't the city's choice. The speed and timing of the announcement were a shock to nearly all involved. But the road to that day was a long and winding one. Now it's the subject of a great new book. It's called No Boston Olympics, Why Smart Cities Are Passing on the Torch with a Forward by yours truly. I'm joined now by the authors of the book, Chris Dempsey, also a co-founder of No Boston Olympics and now director of a group called Transportation for Mass. Good to see you. Thanks, and Andrew Zimbalist, professor of economics at Smith College, also wrote the book Circus Maximus, The Economic Gamble Behind Hosting the Olympics and the World Cup. Gentlemen, it's great to see you both. The book is Good terrific. You. Thank you. Can we start at the end here? It's called No Boston Boston Olympics. I would argue it could be called No Olympics Anywhere Without Financial <laughs> Protection from the IOC. That is what the book says, isn't it? I think so. Right. Yeah. Good enough. Um, is it ever a good deal for the host city? I, there are a couple of cases historically where it's arguably has been a, a good deal, but it, the, the odds are certainly stacked against you. You know, this, it's a great behind-the-scenes story. By the way, you, you shine a light on the stuff we thought we knew and so much great behind-the-scenes stuff. But after having read it for the second time, I would say, despite some of the biggest, most powerful names in, in the city, they did virtually everything wrong. Plus, there was big dig cynicism, and there was this snowstorm in the middle of this thing. So I concluded they had a pretty steep hill to climb, despite the fact that they were the real power brokers in the city. Isn't that yeah. a fair statement? Well, it's true, but I wouldn't say that we can just blame Bostonian cynicism for this. If you look at the early polling, it was actually supportive of the, of the Olympics. It was. Yeah, and then what happened is that as people learned more and more about what the bid meant for them in their communities, they started to like it less. Now, if you had advised the yes people, based on your years of knowledge and your organizational skills around this, could you have concocted a campaign that would have gotten the support of the people of the city or no? I was asked to support the yes people. By Steve Pelliuka, <laughs> yeah. He denies I, it, but uh, you say but he I was invited asked, you in. Yeah. And I, I, didn't, I didn't agree to do it. Because well, it's a matter of principle, think, but if I, you decided to. Well, it's, it's very difficult. A, because the Olympics is a difficult thing to defend from an economic point of view. B, because Boston is a very densely packed small land area, and you need about 8,000 acres to, to do all the stuff that they want you to do. So it's a very hard road to, to hoe, I think, and I, I, I can't imagine having been thrust onto the yes side. If you had been thrust on the yes side, could you have done better than he thinks he could have done? I think Boston could have planned, Boston 2024 could have planned a great Olympics, the problem is that it probably not, would not have been one chosen by the IOC. What the, what the, what? I, well, because the IOC cares about putting on a great television event. So, for example, they want a new stadium next to downtown because that looks great on television. They don't want to go out to Foxborough mm -hmm. or they don't want to use Harvard Stadium. And so it's, it's the pull between the, the public at home and the IOC that gets the boosters but, in trouble. But it seems to me the end of the day, you know, while the Marty Walshes and the John Fishes, who was the first chair, would say, no public money, don't worry, infrastructure, yeah, security maybe, but probably the feds are going to pay. At the end of the day, doesn't it come down to the fact that the IOC will not guarantee that you're not going to lose money? So you can make as many promises as you want. How does the customer, how does the citizen, the voter know that they're not going to be left with the tab? That's the bottom line, isn't it? Well, that's one of the things we're trying to do with this book is to let people know that the bottom line is likely to turn against them, likely to mean either more taxes or, or less services. But, you know, one of the things about the infrastructure that I think sometimes is underappreciated is that the infrastructure very often that does get built is to connect the Olympic venues. It's not necessarily the infrastructure that the city wants. It happened in and London, didn't it? It's, it's happened all over the place. Mm -hmm. It happened most recently in Brazil. The other thing is when you talk about no public money, there's two ways to interpret that. Is the public going to write checks? And yes, they will. But another thing that happens in an, in an even bigger way is that there are massive tax subsidies. They were going to give tax subsidies to a debt circle and Columbia Point that were 20 and 30 times larger than any subsidies that had ever given before in the city of Boston. You know, I, when I read about it, usually my head spins when I hear those kind of things. But when I read about it during the campaign coming out of you, the Globe and other places, this seems to be one of the few efforts in recent years, either in politics or in things like this, where facts actually mattered. Is yeah. that, is that, 
too haughty a statement no, about I think this. That's they exactly did, right. They? Yeah. So Boston 2024 spent about 15 million dollars on spend? their campaign. We like spent 50? less less than 10 thousand uh -huh. dollars. We got out spent 1500 to one, but we had the facts on our side, and we had. I think a great media, you know, we had folks like you, Jim, but so many others in the Boston media. I was impartial, but thank you very much for <laughs> but, your kind but words. Not yes. on our side, but willing to tell our story and willing to share those facts with the public. Uh, you know, Marty Walsh was here a couple of nights ago. Obviously, you know, he was the chief, I don't mean in a pejorative way, cheerleader. He was the biggest uh, guy for this. I asked him about whether or not, we're talking about his run for re-election, about whether or not he'd been s too slow to engage the public in three areas, this shadow over the, uh, over the common, uh, the Indy, South Boston Indy, and... Uh, Boston 2024. Here's part of what he had to say. We went out to the community and the Olympic com 2024 committee. But late in the, the game. Committee. Isn't that no, fair? No, it was early in the game, but no Boston Olympic came out earlier in the game. And they immediately took a position against the Olympics without having a conversation with, with me or anyone on the Olympic side to see what it meant. The IndyCar race... Well, you were disparaging them. I mean, even when they started, you're the, talking about 10 guys on Twitter. Well, in Wasn't some, that you? In, in some, yeah. Okay. If you criticize me, yeah. If you go back and count the numbers, it was okay. 10 people on Twitter. And you were one of the 10 people on Twitter. Was. How do you react to what the mayor had to say, Chris? I think it's a little bit unfair. Um, we actually had meetings scheduled with Boston 2024 that they canceled the day before the meeting. You and did. They, they, they never met with us until after the USOC chose Boston, despite us being very polite with them and saying we want to share our concerns, we want to share our thoughts. They never did that. And I, I think it's uh, really revisionist history to say that we didn't reach out to people on the other side. Quick thought about the mayor. Well, I think that the mayor appropriately and properly is very critical of Donald Trump. And one of the things that Donald Trump gets criticized for the most is that he'll never apologize. I think that Marty Walsh should come out and say, I blew it, I apologize, and stop pointing fig fingers and calling names at other people. He'll be at the library with us tomorrow. I'll tell him you said so. You know, final thing from me. You were a Bostonian of the year, but you were not Bostonian of the year alone. Mm -hmm. With John Fish, the original leader of the opposite, there's some dove in the photograph, we're going to show it here, that uh, kind of thing. One of the things that Shirley Leung, who wrote the piece, did, and John Fish said, was, and Marty Walsh said throughout, all the proponents says, win or lose, the bid itself is going to be, so, I'm paraphrasing, yep. is going to be such a springboard to important discussions about the future. Yep. We're, what, a year and a half out, whatever we are, two years, whatever. Yep. Has that happened? Well, I work on these issues every day, Jim, at Transportation of Massachusetts. This? No, because I care about it, and that's why we got involved in the no side to begin with. I think when you think about the Olympic bid, though, that was about a three-week event, and a three-week event is not the right way to plan a city for the long term. We need long-term thinking, not short-term thinking. But did it, did it cause debate? I know you're in the western part of the state, but you follow this. Did it cause debate about the future of the city to happen in a, the longer term that would not have happened were it not for the bid process, Andrew Zimbalist? Uh, you know, they talked about starting planning committees that were going to look into the future, and they created a few bodies during that short period of time. But those bodies are defunct now. So maybe it got a few people thinking, but institutionally, has there been a change? I don't think so. Have more people been called into the process? I don't think so. Hopefully it will happen. By the way, let me just say, whether you were for, against, or even didn't care about this, this is a great book about a great campaign and a uh, major contribution. Chris Dempsey, thanks Thank so you, much. Jim. Andrew Zimbalist. Thanks so much. Thank you as well. Really appreciate it. The book, again, is called No Boston Olympics, Why Smart Cities Are Passing on the Torch. Make sure to read the foreword.